Okay, as we saw in the last section, a two-person zero-sum game can be strictly determined or non-strictly determined. Well, let's look at an example of a non-strictly determined game. Okay, we're going to play a variation of a two-finger game called Mora. The game involves two players who simultaneously show one or two fingers and agree to a payoff for each combined outcome. Now, if you play this game, don't get smart and try to stick somebody that middle finger. Okay, we will consider the payoff to be the sum of the fingers to R if the sum is even, and the sum of the fingers to C if the sum is odd. So if both players show one finger even, then R wins $2. If one shows one and the other shows two, that would be three fingers, so therefore C wins three dollars. So here's the game matrix. So R is the rows, so one finger and one finger, R would win two dollars, so C would lose two dollars. Uh, one finger and two finger, then uh, R would lose three dollars, so C would win three dollars. And then if you go two fingers R, one finger C, same thing. And then if both show two fingers, then R would um, win $4. So let's see which one it would be more advent advantageous to, R or C. First, let's see if the game is strictly or non-strictly determined. Okay, so in the first row, the minimum is negative 3 for R. And second row, it's also negative 3. For, column, for the columns, for C, the columns... Uh, the maximum for C would be 2 or 4. Well, there's no overlap, so there's no saddle value. So therefore, this game is non-strictly determined. Okay, so how should the players play since there's no saddle point? Well, suppose let's suppose R chose row 2 each time due to the large payoff. So if R chose, if, if R played two fingers each time, then after a while, C would become wise to the strategy and only play one finger so that, so that C could gain $3. But if R switched to row 2, suppose R switched to, uh, let's see, I did row 2. This must be row 1, okay? So suppose R switched to row 1 each time, then C might switch to column 2. Okay, so there appears to be no straightforward strategy. But what about a mixed pattern strategy? How should we choose this uh, mixed pattern strategy? Well, we, we're going to need to talk about probabilities. And we're going to use a probability distribution and some sort of chance device that produces the distribution. For example, R might choose row 1 with probability 1 fourth and row 2 with probability 3 fourths. Now we can do this by placing a white marble in a box with three black marbles and drawing one marble randomly. White marble would represent row one and black marble represent row two. Uh, we would replace the marble before the next draw. And so each time we, we chose to draw, we would have a chance of one-fourth drawn from row one and three-fourths drawn from row two. Now neither, neither would know what row is selected until the marble is drawn. So in the long run, R would play row 1 25% of the time, row 2 75% of the time. Similarly, play C, C might have tendencies. So let's say 3 fifths for column 1 and 2 fifths for column 2 by selecting a marble from a box that contains 3 white and 2 black marbles. In other words, we could set it up so that those would be the probabilities. Okay, so before we begin... Let's let's uh, define some of the strategy. Okay, so let's say we're given the game matrix M here. And let's say our strategy is P1 and P2. So this is like the 1 fourth and the 3 fourths. So with a 1 fourth probability to choose one row and a 3 fourths probability to choose another. And Q strategy would be Q1 and Q2 where... I mean, C's strategy would be Q1 and Q2, where Q1 might be the three-fifths and Q2 be the two-fifths. So in, in that case, then 
R would be using this strategy with a one-fourth probability row one and a three-fourths probability row two, and C would be using this strategy with a three-fifths probability for column one and a two-fifths probability for column two. Now I know this is getting a little strange here, but uh, just hear it out. If one of the elements in P or Q is one, then the other element must be zero. So if this was a one, then this would have to be a zero. Or if this was a one, then this would have to be a zero because the sum of the row and the sum of the column have to add up to one. In this game, uh, we found that pure strategies choosing row two each time were not the best choice. Um, pure strategies are always used in strictly determined games, but this game is not strictly determined. So if you remember from the first section, we had strictly determined games and we could always choose uh, like the, wherever the saddle point was. So we need a mixed strategy that gives us success in the long run. So in order to do this, we need to talk about expected value. Okay, so if we talk about the expected value of a matrix game for person R, okay, we're going to alter the formula a bit using two variables, P and Q. Let me just give it to you. Given the game matrix M, and let's say these are the probabilities for P, and these are the probabilities for Q, in other words, these, this is for player R and this is for player C, then the expected value of PQ, denoted by the notation expected value, E for expected value of PQ, is actually P times M times Q. Okay, so in other words, if we multiply these three matrices together, we actually get the expected value of PMQ. Okay, so let me show you how that would work. Let's say that this was our, our game matrix, and these are the probabilities for R, and these are the probabilities for C. Okay, now if we multiply these three together, if you multiply P times M, you would get negative 7 fourths times 9 fourths. And then if you multiply that by Q, you get negative 21 over 20 plus 18 over 20, which is negative 3 twentieths, which is negative 0.15. So the expected value of PQ, the expected value of PQ would actually be negative 0.15. So that's how you find the expected value using a game matrix and then the two strategies P and Q. Okay, so let's talk about the development of this expected value. Based on the matrix, there's four possibilities, two, negative three, negative three, and four. And here's the uh, game matrix, and here's P, and here's Q in decimal. For a payoff of A equal two to occur, in other words, for two to occur, uh, R must choose row one and C must choose row one. Well, the probability of this occurring, the probability that R chooses row one is 0.25, the probability that C chooses column one is 0.6, so you get 0.15. Uh, for B negative three, then R must choose one, R, row one, C must choose column two. And the probability that R chooses row one is 0.25, the probability we choose C chooses column two is 0.4, so that would be 0.10. And you can do the other two, but basically you're just multiplying the probability from each, uh, from this matrix to this matrix to get the values. Okay, now, so if we wanted to find the expected value that way, then we would just take each of these numbers times their corresponding probabilities and add them together, just like we did in probability chapters. So 2 times 0.15 minus 3 times 0.10 minus 3 times 0.45 plus 4 times 0.3 and we get the same answer that we got above. So, but obviously we don't have to do it that way. Um, you saw above we can just multiply the uh, product up here of P, M, Q. Okay, so in the long run with R and C using those given strategies the expected payoff is negative 15 cents per trial and C wins 15 cents per trial. Now, can R do better than losing 15 cents per trial? Well, let's see how the expected value of PQ is calculated. Basically, um, 
you're going to multiply, if you have those three matrices, A, B, C, D, and then P1, P2, and Q1, Q2, well, it's basically going to be A times P1, Q1, plus B times P1, Q2, and so forth, if you looked at all the entries. Now, if you enter the values for A, B, and C, D, um, try my, my mouse here, so you'd have 2, negative 3, negative 3, and 4. Um, we can eliminate variables. Remember that P2 is 1 minus P1, and Q2 is 1 minus Q1. So you can replace those variables, and you can do a little bit of algebra, which I omitted the steps, and you can get that that uh, the expected value of PQ is 12P1Q1 minus 7P1 minus 7Q1 plus 4, and then do a little, more, a little bit of rearranging and some more algebra, and you can get that this is the expected value of PQ. Now, so you can see that if R chooses P1 such that 12P1 minus 7 is 0, then P1 would be 7 twelfths. So if you were to plug that in, and you could plug this in, and, and so if we let P1 be 7 twelfths, of course that would mean P2 is 5 twelfths, if we plug that into the expected value, then we could get that the expected value is negative 1 twelfth. Now that's approximately losing 8 cents. So that actually um, is better than losing 15 cents on average. So an average loss of 8.3 cents is better than an average loss of 15 cents. And it turns out that is the best strategy. And I won't explain it, but that's the best strategy. So in summary, the optimal strategy for R is choosing row 1 7 twelfths of the time and row 2 5 twelfths of the time. And for C, it can also be shown the same for, for, for C, 7 twelfths and 5 twelfths. Now, P and Q are generally different, but due to symmetry in this problem, they're the same. Okay, so if you multiply M times P times Q in this example, in other words, if you say, um, in other words, if you say that for uh, R, we'll use these probabilities, and for Q, we'll use these probabilities, and you multiply them together, you'll find that the expected value is for R to lose approximately neg negative one twelfth of a dollar or negative eight point three cents. So um, that's that's the answer for the best strategy. And so the let's talk about the fundamental theory of, theory of gaming. For every M by N matrix game M, there exist strategies P star and Q star that are not necessarily unique for R and C respectively, and a unique number V such that P times P star times MQ is greater than or equal to V for every strategy Q and C, and PM times Q star is greater than or equal to V for every strategy P and R. Now, the number V is called the value of the game and is the security level for both R and C. If C is zero, then the game is said to be fair. Furthermore, any strategies P star and Q star that satisfy the theorem are called optimal strategies, respectively. It can be shown that V is the largest guaranteed expectation that R can obtain, irrespective of C's play. Surprisingly, V is also the smallest expectation that C can allow for R, irrespectively of R's play. Essentially, the fundamental theorem states that every matrix game has optimal strategies for R and C and a unique value V. Finding these optimal strategies and the corresponding values of a matrix is called solving the game. The triplet V, P star, Q star is called the solution to the game. An immediate consequence of this theorem is that the expected value of the game for R when both R and C use optimal strategies is V. That is why V is called the value of the game. So below is the theorem that states this. And I will use the next video to show you some examples of finding these values for a game.